The ocean is full of secrets. For centuries, we exploited it, pushed it to its limits, before we understood. But now, we are unlocking perhaps the biggest secret of all. We'll go together on a journey around this blue planet. Discover the hidden power of the ocean to sustain us, to protect us, to heal our climate. Learn how every small thing you do can make a huge difference. And how by helping the ocean, we help ourselves. This decade, we rewrite the future. Be part of the story. There's only one planet, only one ocean, only one way to do this. Together. everybody and welcome. This is Women in the Frontlines and this panel is about the importance of underwater filmmaking for impact. Uh, we're going to be sharing the next hour with a handful of some of the most adventurous women out there, uh, women who actually know how to wield a camera underwater and all around. And I'm super excited to be moderating this panel, so let's get to it. My name is Christina Mittermeier. I'm a photographer and I'm a conservationist. And for the next hour, I'm just asking the question. So let's get to it. I think we need to start by introducing ourselves. Lizzie, do you want to start? Thanks, Christina. Um, hello, everyone. I'm Lizzie Daly. Um, my background is primarily as a as a biologist, so uh, I'm studying uh, using tags, various different species to understand fine scale movement, so everything from penguins uh, to African elephants, and I'm also a broadcaster, so I've had a great opportunity of working with the likes of BBC, National Geographic, a bit, bit about my background, and actually I've got some clips here which show you a little bit more about uh, what I do. Mm. Lord, can you give me a little bit of grace? Oh, can you hear me? It's been one of those days. So I'll be waiting down by the river banks. You know I'll be praying, so please don't delay. Don't delay. Lord, can you give me a little bit of faith? I want to believe and I don't want to break. A moment of relief would go a long way. You know I'll be praying. Erica Woolsey. I'm trained as a marine biologist with a specialty in coral reef ecology. I'm originally from the San Francisco Bay Area, so the land of redwood trees and kelp forests, and I've uh, found warmer waters. And in my explorations and in my research, I've really come to care about the impacts of climate change and more direct human activities on coral reef health and ocean health. And so a big part of what I'm trying to do now is translate scientific discovery in our ocean into public understanding through my nonprofit called The Hydras. And one of the big projects we're leading is the use of virtual reality to take people on virtual dives so that all of the people in the world who have never dived and may never have the opportunity to dive in real life can feel what it's like to be underwater and connect to these beautiful and threatened ecosystems. 
So I have a clip prepared that will give you an overview of that immersive experience and our work to bring human connection to the ocean. The mission of the Hydras is to create what we like to call open access oceans so that all people can explore and understand beautiful and threatened ocean ecosystems. To do this, the Hydras uses scalable emerging technologies like immersive virtual reality to design and deliver interactive and engaging educational experiences that generate ocean science literacy and stewardship so that together we can imagine and build a sustainable blue future. So now we're going all the way to India and Malaika Vas. Where are you in Goa? Yes, I am in Goa. And so great to see everyone here. I have to say that I'm so inspired by every single woman on this panel today. And yeah, I'm a wildlife filmmaker and a presenter. And my work focuses on telling stories about how we have a footprint on the planet and how, you know, we have human wildlife conflict, especially in my country, and illegal wildlife trafficking. So for the last couple of years, I've been working as a TV presenter and filmmaker, telling these stories for networks like National Geographic, Al Jazeera, the BBC now and Discovery Channel. But for me, the most exciting thing is when that TV show goes out and I have someone from the local community coming back to me and saying, hey, we watched the show and we love that you actually got our perspective represented on camera, not just the wildlife. So that's why I'm in it. And here's a tiny clip from one of my most recent documentaries. that in 50 years we've lost, or actually we've taken, we've eaten more than 90% of the big fish in the sea. We as a species learned how to grow food 10,000 years ago. But even today, when it comes to the oceans, we still hunt. My name is Malaika Vaz, and I'm an investigative filmmaker focused on shining a light on the wildlife trade globally. Three years ago, I discovered a massive trade in manta rays originating from my country's waters. Look, there's gilpates there. This is what they're after. I'm following the trail of this transnational contraband. Can you say? A trade that could very well mean extinction for one of the most enigmatic ambassadors of our ocean. Now we're going to uh, Bristol, Inca, is that where you are? Yes, I am. I'm in Bristol at the moment. Hi, everybody. So nice to see you all. Um, I'm so excited to be here. My background is in marine biology, and I currently work as an underwater photographer and as a wildlife filmmaker. And what I'm really passionate about is kind of taking that understanding of our oceans and of the natural world and translating them into something that is beautiful, that we can portray on screen, that gets people excited about the ocean and kind of brings them into that world that I've fallen in love with so much over the years. So my favorite part about that is definitely the scientists that I get to work with from all different corners of the planet and being able to really tell their stories in a way that they can't just through their research. Um, and this is a little clip that we're gonna show you of some of the work that I've been doing um, underwater and I hope you enjoy it. We are at a tipping point. It is our actions in the next 10 years that will define the future of our oceans for centuries. I may never be able to see our reefs the way my father once did, and I can't tell his stories. 
those reefs belong to the past. Now, we need to look to the future and create stories of our own. The story I hope to tell is of resilience, innovation and passion. How my generation rebuilt our oceans. Our oceans aren't only an incredible source of inspiration and beauty, but they also have an incredible economic and environmental importance. It's estimated that 500 million people are reliant on our coral reefs. Cutting edge science and wet labs to find ways to not just monitor the health of their reefs, but plant new ones. Working in collaboration with local fishermen, they have created fish sanctuaries that will give these reefs the time they need. Our kelp forests don't only create essential habitats, they also capture huge amounts of carbon, provide us with the air we breathe, and protect our coastlines from erosion. They protect us, just as we should protect them. Pretty amazing. Um, I have to say that I'm a little older than all of you, and um, I remember back to the days when communications was just considered uh, an entertainment, you know, so it was really difficult to fund it and nobody took it seriously. And we didn't have any way of measuring our impact, but we've come a long way. And so I want to go around uh, the, the circle again to ask about your journey uh, to become somebody that has a camera, somebody who's a communicator, somebody who's a translator and an interpreter of the natural world for people, like you said, Erica, who may never ever go underwater. So let's start with you, Lizzie, and let's hope that the audio um, works this time. Yes, hopefully you can you can actually hear me. Is that is that all right? Great, okay. Yeah, I mean, impact is the kind of key word there, I guess. And ultimately that's why we all do what we do, right? And um, whatever role that may be, whether it's as a photographer or filmmaker, presenter, you know, founder of an NGO, ultimately we're all trying to create positive change for our oceans, for our planet and to change minds uh, long-term. So, I mean, my journey, I guess, is a little bit, a little bit different in that um, I've, I've always loved studying wildlife, you know, science underpins everything that we know about our natural world. So it's an integral part of it, but it is only part of it because you still have to reach these hard to reach audiences. And so that kind of partnering it with telling stories about the natural world just completely has made sense to me throughout my career as a scientist so far. So, you know, the, for a large part of that, it's about uh, presenting for me and that to be honest, came about through just one, you know, I'd be by myself, I'd find a fantastic natural history story on the coast, and there'd be no one else there to tell it. So it would be a case of me wanting to share it and having that kind of love for the moment. And we're just wanting to share that. So the presenting side of it, it kind of just came uh, through that and doing it more. And it's just a tool, really. It's a really valuable tool to inspire others, to connect with other people and to create that impact that you were talking about. So, um, yeah, whether you're you're an underwater filmmaker or, or photographer or presenter, we're all in it for the same reasons. And um, creating that impact on a large scale is the ultimate goal. Yeah. Oh. Erica, how about you? Wow, oh, I'm just diving with everything Lizzie is saying. <laughs> so I'll um, I'll tell you a little bit about how I I uh, am very much a parallel thinker there. So I grew up tide pooling and learned how to dive with my dad and brother. And something that I've always loved to do throughout my science career is find ways to bring people to the ocean. Uh, whether it's working as a dive master or a kayak guide. Um, so I'm very interested in inclusion and accessibility to ocean environments. And, you know, one of the issues is I can't take everybody to the ocean. Um, and so what are ways we can bring the ocean to everybody? And like Lizzie said, it's all about um, using it as a tool. It's not an end to itself. Um, I'm interested in VR because it's scalable and it can reproduce those feelings of presence and agency and get people excited. Um, but if the evidence doesn't show that that's effective, I'm, I'm not going to use it. I'm gonna find another way. And I just, again, I love bringing people to the ocean, but I'm one person, how can we scale? And this type of storytelling that 
everyone on this panel does with imagery and uh, visuals and just personal stories is so valuable when it comes to connecting because how can we care about and protect things we never see or experience? Yeah, you know, as a, as a scientist early on in my career, I realized that the way we were talking about the environment and nature was so highbrow and so elitist. And people mm. who don't have a background in science sometimes, you know, how can you engage in a conversation when you feel uninformed or, you know, incompetent in the subject? So I think visual storytelling, filmmaking is such a wonderful way to open the door so much bigger for everybody to enter this conversation. Um, Inca, you grew up tide pooling as well. I did, absolutely. I was, I grew up in Brighton on the south coast of England and it was my favorite place to hang out as a kid and definitely where that natural curiosity for our oceans began. And it was that tide pooling on my local ecosystem that I really began to be so interested in marine biology and what made me pursue a degree in marine biology. But I think like what you were saying, I became so frustrated by the fact that I think we're, we live in a time now where we know what the issues are that we're dealing with with our oceans. The biggest problem is inaction. And I found for myself studying marine biology and thinking about what my next step was, it was like, well, yeah, we can keep doing this research, keep publishing these papers, but in unless anyone's actually listening and they care, we're not gonna make a difference. And that was why for me, I decided to move more into the photography and the film side of things is because I wanted people to see the value in making those differences and why all of that research is so important. And I felt that through film and through photography, I could show people why I was so passionate about those ecosystems and get them just as excited and want to protect them as well. So that's how I kind of diverged into the world of film. Now, Malaika, you have a very different, uh, you know, journey and path to getting into where you are today because you didn't come at it from the science. You came as a, as a sportswoman and as an athlete. Can you tell us a little more about it? Yeah. So I actually grew up on the coast as well, and I spent so much time windsurfing and diving and representing India at these competitions outside. So it was very, you know, adventure based for me. And I realized that when I started diving, I mean, I could see nothing like the visibility is really bad out here. It's brown, murky water. So you go underwater and you can't even see your diving instructor when you first start. And then I realized that, you know, India does have so much biodiversity. So I started going to the landing sites and the fishing markets right next to where I lived. And that's where I began to see sharks and mantas and turtles and all of the amazing biodiversity that I only saw pictures of in other people's countries, right? And I realized that our country actually has a huge issue, which is the fact that we have a massive coastline all across and it's many developing countries as well, but we don't really have the economic um, opportunity to kind of harness that and you know build opportunities for communities because that's so important to kind of you know value that biodiversity it's not just about the fact that manta rays right behind me are really fun and amazing it's also about the fact that they can bring in tourism revenue and when I started to see from that perspective I really wanted to focus on stories that talk about illegal wildlife trafficking in my country and how we can kind of go down to the very core of this problem and understand what the community needs and for the communities I mean people often paint these guys and you know this Christina as the bad guys who are out there um, killing wildlife but at the end of the day just like us right they're trying to put three meals on the table for their families and I think that empathy is really important not just from a wildlife perspective and a human perspective but from a larger ecosystem perspective because um, I can give you an example. Recently, I was working on a documentary focused on the manta ray trade from India to Hong Kong and China. And as part of that, we were looking at the work that you know fishermen are doing with harvesting and killing manta rays. But what I realized was that, you know, if we ask them to stop right now and say that, you know, you have to stop for conservation reasons, it's going to be really hard. But if you explain to them that these animals will go extinct anyway in the next 10 years if we don't stop, and then that's going to be bad for both the ecosystem and the community. Mm -hmm. And then you also provide them with alternative opportunities for education and employment. That's when you can change things around. And I think for me, that's the essence of it, making sure that it works out for the communities as well. That's amazing, Malaika. When I read all of your biographies, it struck me, you know, that these, there's a common title, you know, wildlife presenter. And to me, that's a job. But what you guys really are uh, is you're ambassadors for all these wild things and you bring a very feminine perspective 
to a job. You know, I often, I oftentimes feel like um, as women with cameras doing this work, it's almost like we landed in an extraterrestrial planet populated only by men. <laughs> so, <laughs> so it is very challenging, you know, but it's not just about the gear that's not made for women. It's not just about the dangers that are inherent to traveling alone. And it's not just about this invisibility cloak that we all wear just because we're women. I want to know, Lizzie, um, what do you think are the, the challenges, you know, of making it in this, in this field? And I want you to respond thinking about all the other girls and women who are watching this, wanting to do this job. What can we tell them? Oh, wow, that's a big question. Um, I mean, if they're watching this, then what an amazing panel of women for a start. It's a good, good place to start. Um, I think my message, I guess, would be to young women or any, any woman watching this wanting to get in wildlife film is like, find other women. There are so many fantastic, inspiring, talented women like here that are carrying out incredible work. And for whatever reason, um, and discrimin discriminatory reasons about women in the industry, you know, they're there. It's just about, about finding them and building up a network of, of connecting with these women who are who are doing really brilliant things. I think um, you know, it's it's the little things that both as a scientist and kind of a filmmaker and presenter, you just people assume about you, or just li little tiny moments where you know you're on a team and everyone's a man, uh, a white man around you, and it's a case of just um I guess it, it's it's hard because also in that environment, you know, you're there's there's not pressure to kind of to kind of push through those boundaries, but there's almost like an extra drive to push through those boundaries. And it's something that you see across the whole industry. Um, and challenges don't just come in terms of like be, being a woman in the industry, but then also like actually putting projects together, um, uh, getting funding for those projects and actually making those projects happen and create actual change. So I think there's there's lots of different layers. And um, you know, recently I would say that the wildlife film industry was starting to see some of those positive changes, um, those positive changes in attitudes and actually kind of pulling down that idea that we are, you know, in our old ways and sticking with those old ways and creating kind of new, a new influx of, of, of women, powerful women who are doing incredible work. So true. Um, what about you, Erica? What's your experience uh, breaking into a field dominated by men? Well, um, my esteemed panelists um, will know a lot more about their experiences in filmmaking because I'm relatively new to it, but I can speak to um, women in STEM is a very interesting field um, to, be, uh, to be in because, I mean, the system isn't broken. It was built this way. It was designed originally for white men in the global north who have wives at home to run the households. And so what's really important, I think, moving forward is not necessarily focusing on equality in a system that was built for someone else, but looking at equity. And so the difference there, of course, is equity is addressing the needs and meeting people where they are. And that's for women, that's for intersectional um, people, that's for underrepresented minorities. And I recently saw a really great presentation by um, Dr. Amanda uh, Messino, who proposed that the metaphor of the leaky pipeline, where women and underrepresented minorities kind of drop out because we know that a lot of undergrads love science, but over the course of the degrees, much fewer people earn them and then get to you know professor level. But what's the problem with that leaky pipeline is it only shows one path. The people mm -hmm. that leave that pipeline don't just disappear and go down the drain. There's this amazing network of people working on the peripheries. And as we talked about before, um, when it comes to publishing and being a scientist and being an academia, and Inca um, mentioned this, um, your audience gets smaller and smaller as you specialize. And if you're dealing with an ecosystem that is undergoing immediate threats, your audience needs to be getting bigger and bigger. And so by leaving that pipeline, it doesn't mean that you leave science. Um, just because I'm not on the tenure track anymore doesn't mean I'm not still a scientist. And what I love the, the visualization that Dr. Messino proposed is rather than a pipeline, it's a series of interconnected riverways and deltas. 
And so I would say that everyone on this panel is part of that Delta system. And as long as we have that support in that community and not uh, pass any judgment on ourselves or others for leaving a field, quote unquote, I would um, say that you need to keep doing what you're doing and amplify your voice and take those things that might have been told uh, might, you might have been told that aren't suitable for something like, for instance, me and my empathy and my feeling of feelings is actually a strength when I thought it was a weakness when I was in, in academia. And so keep doing what you're doing and the right people will find you. That is so, so wise. And I love it. I'm going to look up this paper, Dr. Amanda Messino. Amanda um, Messino, it was a, a presentation she gave that I joined and it was all about um, bias and data. That's amazing. You know, when I was coming up through the ranks of National Geographic and feeling like I was somehow invisible, I decided to use that invisibility almost as a, as a superpower. You know, I thought I'm just going to surprise everybody. And, <laughs> and I did. Uh, but um, Inca, tell us about your experiences. You're so young. Are you 23, 24 years old? No, 26 now. So 26. Really close oh. <laughs> <laughs> Um, yeah, I think so much, like Erica was saying, with the wildlife filmmaking world, you are balancing both this STEM world where it's male oriented, and then you've also got the filmmaking world where, again, it's that same issue. And I think they're so connected in that sense. And that's where the wildlife filmmaking is fantastic, because you've got a chance to actually really raise the platform of some fantastic women in science, of different people from different backgrounds and minorities, and really showcase them in the STEM world and show the value of that. And by kind of pushing those voices more and more, we'll see more and more young women of all different backgrounds pursuing science, getting into film. So it's one of these ones that I kind of, I love that it comes hand in hand, but it does mean that you you have to fight both sides to get where you get where you are. So it's a really interesting one. And I think that it's actually a really exciting time to be in this industry. And, despite the fact that we are still having to push all sorts of boundaries that are there, everybody seems to be a lot more welcoming of the idea that you are going to have female camera operators. There are so many people who are passionate about finding them. They want to have more women in these higher positions, and there are so many people there helping you along the way. So I think even if maybe you haven't seen someone who looks like you or who you can relate to in one of those roles, you should never rule it out for yourself. And you just have to believe in yourself that little bit more. And that in today's world, as long as you're reaching out to the right people and you're showing your genuine enthusiasm and passion, you'll be amazed by how many people are there to support you. So it's a really exciting time to be getting into this industry, I think. Yes. <laughs> I agree. I hear an airplane going over, over, over but I, I want to go to you, Malaika, because you and I grew up in countries that are still a lot more traditional in the values oriented to women. And I, I remember when I was 23 years old, my grandmother was telling me, you know, you're already getting old. When are you going to have children? When are you going to get married? You know, <laughs> what's your experience? You know, you've broken through all sorts of boundaries. Tell us about it. I think even though I did grow up and I do live in India, my parents and my family are really open and they probably shoot me if I said I was getting married at 23. So it has been the other way around. But um, what I would say is that initially when I started, I started being a wildlife filmmaker when I was 18 years old, right out of high school, actually. I didn't even go to college. Um, it was really hard because I had these stories that I wanted to tell and these communities that I wanted to interview. But more than actually being a woman, I found being young really hard because people take you a lot more seriously because, of course, we have David Attenborough on television. He's amazing. Yes. And no one else can kind of emulate him. But what you can do is you can be your authentic self. And I think that's something that really strikes a chord with anyone, regardless of what part of the world that you are in. And for me, growing up, I watched a lot of, you know, National Geographic and the BBC and Discovery. And I realized that while the stories were amazing, I never saw someone who was brown and a woman on there. I didn't, never saw someone who was Indian telling stories about our own country and other countries. And I think that people from across the world need to be telling stories about different issues, because that just means that we have more representation and we have more diverse ways of understanding one specific topic. So for me, that's been really exciting. And I also have to say that 
you know, being 23 in 2021 and being a wildlife presenter is an advantage because I am standing on the backs of all of the women who came before me, who set the stage and, you know, went through really difficult challenges and just kind of made space for us. And I feel so grateful for that. And I hope to make even more space for lots more women from different parts of the world, because it's not just about gender diversity. It's also about diversity in terms of countries. And we need to see more women from Kenya and Mozambique and India and Sri Lanka and the UK as well, telling stories about wildlife. We can't just have the same kind of women. I love that. You know, guys, one of the most difficult aspects about our work is to measure the impact. And I always tell people that conservation is never a sprint, it's always a marathon. And for yeah. people that fund projects, you know, they have this mindset of the return on investment, you know, and it's very, very difficult to quantify. Uh, Lizzie, I would love to know how you think about, uh, you know, reporting on that impact. Yeah, it's a really good question because you can look at impact in lots of different ways. And uh, goodness knows I have made films that have made no impact, but this is part of the journey that I'm on in making my own stories that I'm passionate about and stories that need telling. This is part of the journey and I'm still on it. Um, so I guess, you know, for, for, you know, when you get the opportunities to work with um, the likes of BBC and National Geographic, a lot of that comes with reach, you know, how many people can you reach? And then there's another element to that. And that's actually what people are, are going to change in their everyday on the back of that. Maybe they'll go away and now look at the ecology of a Gen 2 penguin behind me because they love learning about their guano I don't know or it could be you know a new area that needs protecting they need to establish a new MPA on the back of seeing something I mean there's different measures of impact it can be views it can be um it can be distribution you know how many people have, have where in the world has that film reached and then it's action as well so for example um the salmon farming uh, project that has been an ongoing project a passion project for me has um actually not received let's be honest that that much reach in terms of views but for me it was a really important project because in terms of impact it led to salmon farmers seeing it uh, changing the way that they actually farm in Shetland you know stopping the shooting of seals and um that's a that's a long-term project it actually for me the impact of that is is hugely valuable and that not, not is necessarily, you know, a high quality produced series or anything. It's something that you're passionate about. And if you tell the right story, people will will watch it and want to be part of that. I um, totally agree. Yeah. Yeah. So it's 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 an it's a real like mix of different types of impact, and they're all really important, definitely. It's 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 not for the for those with a uh, you know thin skin. You have to be here for the long run, Erica. What you do with uh, VR yeah. is so creates such an instant emotional impact. I mean, you surely see impact in a in a very immediate way. Absolutely, especially since I used to measure impact with things like degree temperature change <laughs> and percent mortality and you know percent marine protected area. That's there are a lot of ways to measure success. And ultimately those are the things I wanna like have an impact on in terms of controlling uh, global uh, climate change and the warming of our mm -hmm. ocean and protecting marine protected areas. And what I saw as the biggest uh, barrier to translation is we know what to do, we know what's happening. We just need the sort of political will and behavior change and policy change to take it over. And so I focus a lot of my energy on, again, bringing people to the ocean and showing them how incredible and important it is, not only for uh, the planet, but for the human communities that rely directly on them. And so this tool of VR really compelled me because of what I had been reading in the research uh, of it being used to increase feelings of empathy and connections and presence and agency. In fact, um, I am PI on a National Science Foundation grant with the Virtual Human Interaction Lab at Stanford University that does that exact kind of research. And so I'm taking beyond the sort of intuition I have when I take someone out of a headset and they are just so excited and want to tell me their ocean story. And I, again, because I'm so interested in scalability, I want to recreate that experience as much as possible. 
And if VR can do that, then I think that's a wonderful tool, especially as it becomes more available and accessible. I think it's just awesome to have a scientist at your level who's not afraid to talk about feelings and empathy. I just think it's so fresh and yeah. so valuable. Well, what's wonderful is I had this great experience at the design school at Stanford called the D School. And I really learned there that when you're solving big problems, they need to be human centered. You can't just have a one size fits all. It has to lead with empathy and connection if you want to scale and have real impact. Um, of course, all of the problems in our ocean is human centered. And so the solutions must be as well. Yeah, but I, I, I love that because it is human centered. And Inca, I just watched this morning, uh, My 25, your new film, <laughs> and it is so emotional and it's so human centric. It's the story of you and your dad. And I, I think that type of connection makes it so easy to relate to. Can, can you tell us more about uh, the making of the film, what the, the impact that you've seen? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I think that was what well, that whole film was based on. But I wanted to talk about ecosystems and how they've changed and shifting baselines. And it was one of these concepts that when you talk about it from a science perspective, people just don't grasp it. And you're talking about something that is occurring on such a huge level and is really critical, but people just they can't put it in into their lives and it doesn't make sense to them. And I realized actually by looking at it as something as simple as something my dad experienced within my lifetime, I can't experience now because it's just gone. Mm -hmm. And it was trying to find that thing that everyone can relate to. And I think everybody has those experiences. You've been to an amazing place. You've seen that sun and coral reef. The idea that you could go back there in 25 years and it's just gone, that's heartbreaking. And that to me was kind of that underlying thread that I carried across the entire film is because I wanted to show people just how vulnerable these things are and how we shouldn't be taking them for granted and how quickly things can change. Um, and I also wanted to make sure that with that film, in terms of the impact that it's leaving behind, that you're not just left feeling depressed and you don't watch the film and at the end of it, you're just like, oh, well, there's no hope in that. I guess it's all gone <laughs> because that's not what we're in this industry for. We want to inspire people. We want to make them hopeful. We want to drive action. And I was able to work with this fantastic organization in Jamaica called the Alligator Head Foundation, who really work to not only protect their local coastline, but to integrate the community into those protections. So it's really looking at the human aspect about how can you work with the community to make sure that all of these new legislations that are going to protect the ocean are going to ensure that they still have a good livelihood, that they are still happy with their quality of life, that they're not taking away from those fundamental things that make them who they are. And that was really important when they were kind of designing this entire MPA. And I just thought it was a fantastic story to tell of their work and what they're doing to protect these oceans for future generations. And that was the thing with the creation of an MPA is that you're not gonna see the benefits within your lifetime. So I felt that it tied in really well with this idea of the baselines and how I can't experience the ocean that my dad's experienced because just like that's the same for these fishermen who have stopped fishing, they're never gonna be able to see the benefit, but they're doing it because they're hoping that their children will one day. So mm. yeah, that was my film. <laughs> That's amazing, Inka. And Malika, you are, um, you've done some incredible films yourself, but you also, you also are an incredible public speaker. I, I've seen a couple of your presentations online and you have such incredible stage presence. I have found in my career that one of the best ways to have impact, you know, even though it's smaller scale, is so impactful. Can you tell us a little bit about, um, you know, your thoughts on impact and being a, an ambassador for wild things? Sure, and I think honestly, um, I just like being a conduit for other people's stories. Like I'm just like the vessel through which it flows. That's the way I think yeah. about it. And that's why I get so excited about every single documentary that I make. Um, but what I would say about impact is that yes, it is important to be empathetic during the storytelling process. But what I would say is in the pre-production process, when you're figuring out the story, being rational and kind of stepping back a bit is also really important. And I think women do a great job at that. And what I would say about that is, you know, when you decide that you want to make a documentary about something, think about the impact that it would have, like what is the intended impact? And then mm. kind of backtrack from there to figure out what the steps are to get there. And for me, the way I do that is ask myself, what would I want to do once this film gets out? What is the action in the world that we need? 
And then what's the audience for that? And sometimes, you know, with the Manchuria documentary, the audience is policymakers because we realize that these animals have zero protection under the Indian law. So while they might have international protection under CITES, that doesn't matter within regional borders, as long as you don't have the Indian government or the you know, Malaysian government's opinion on it, that it is illegal, it doesn't matter. So that's why for the Manta Ray documentary, our audience is probably five people. And of course it will mm. go out on television, but the audience really is five people. But then mm. I also worked on a documentary recently in November, which was focused on elephant trafficking. And now that is an issue which is facilitated by us because people across the world ride elephants as part of the tourism sector. And I think that given that was, you know, the issue, I realized that going with a much broader network like the BBC, which we eventually went with, um, was an exciting way to kind of get the story out to larger audiences. Because if people across the world can realize that they can have a tangible impact through their actions, they will do it. I mean, I'm so optimistic about this generation and the generation above us. And I think that if we put those solutions out there and we, in ways that are accessible to our audiences, they're going to jump on it. I love that. Mm -hmm. We only have a few minutes left, so I want to do two things. I'm, I'm going to go around and ask you what you're currently working on, and then I would love to have a little bit of time at the end just to ask you what, you, what you're hopeful about. So, Lizzie, let's start with you. What are you working on? So, um, at the moment, um, it's kind of over the years, have been working on looking at the wildlife on our doorstep, as we all should be, or celebrating what you know and love most. So, um, a big project for me at the moment is looking at um, how we use MPAs and um, what's called UMPAs, uh, HMPAs, sorry, which are highly marine protected areas. And what that means and how management can come around in protection and what that kind of the steps from that in the UK. Um, but uh, as well as that, I'm actually working on a project at the moment about the shark finning trade that was big here in Europe. And recently we've seen a huge push um, uh, from Shark Guardian who did a big campaign around banning the imports of 20 kilograms of shark fins into the UK per person. Mind blowing, that's even a thing. So uh, for that, I mean, that's an ongoing project with Shark Guardian and hopefully will be put together into a bit of a film to look at long-term uh, movements. And as Malika was talking about earlier, you know, it's a big machine it involves talking to communities and, and those who potentially misunderstand the issues around that. Um, so it's a really exciting project, which hopefully will uh, have an impact in what is a big global trade. On the scale of these problems, we need an army of female camera women. I know. <laughs> Erica, what about you? What are you working on? Oh, man. Um, well, first of all, I have this ongoing, amazing research with the Stanford VR Lab. In fact, we just published our first paper from that research, which looks into the effects of what we're coining double immersion, where you have an underwater waterproof VR headset while you're floating in a pool. So that was just published in Scientific <gasps> Report. Check it oh. out. Um, if you have a chance, it's a technology <laughs> from um, Ballast VR. And uh, let's see, I'm also working on creating a new virtual reality piece, which is interactive. So it'll train users to become marine biologists. Um, we just worked with the Smithsonian Institution to make their back of house coral specimen collection open access and available to anyone um, from digitizing their 3D models. So check that out. You can also play with it in augmented reality, which is really fun. Um, and something I definitely want you all to, to know about is I am leading a new podcast with Danny Washington of Big oh, New, yes. Maria Soled Bianco of World Rise, and it's called 21st Century Mermaids. So it's all about women in the ocean. And I would <laughs> love to send an invitation to all of you to be guests for season two. Um, season one launches on February 21st. And I, I saw on your Brilliant. website, the Bomb Foundation funds that, and they're so uh, philanthropic and generous. So a big shout out to um, to the Bomb Foundation. Malik, I'm going to mix it up and go to you. What are you working on? Well, right now I'm actually working on a manta ray policy campaign. So I think that, you know, you can't do this with every single film, but with certain films that really <laughs> tug at your heartstrings, you can kind of invest your um, energies into following up after the documentary is done. So that's what I'm doing right now and trying to get 
these animals protected in India's waters and in other countries around here. So fingers crossed, inshallah, that happens. But the second thing that I'm working on right now is a story on bats in the pandemic, and that's for Al Jazeera. And it's because uh, the reason I wanted to work with a network that wasn't primarily a wildlife network is because I think that environmental stories aren't reported about as much in the mainstream as they should be. We need to see every single channel having, you know, environmental stories on their primetime shows. We need to have it every single way because it is the biggest story of our time. So the story that I'm working on right now focuses on how protecting habitat is a way to prevent future pandemics. And I'm super excited about it because I think that this, you know, 2020 and the COVID pandemic kind of gave us an opportunity to step back and realize that we need to put the, the natural world first. And I think that it's going to result in good things for everyone. It's amazing. I love that. Inka, what are you working on? Like Lizzie, I've currently been focusing a lot more on local wildlife and I've been working with the Marine Conservation Society to develop some new educational outreach resources, which I'm really excited about. So just kind of some short form content that we're hoping is going to get kids really excited about the ocean and getting out there and learning more about what they have on their doorstep. And then in addition to that, I've been working on a big ocean series uh, for Wild Space Productions, which is really exciting. And we're about a year into production at the moment and getting ready to start going on shoot. So that's a really exciting project that I can't say much more about at the moment, but <laughs> it's going to be a really exciting one for our oceans that hopefully you'll all see in a few years time. It's amazing. So we, we have a little more than five minutes left. And I just have to say that on my very, very long career, there's never been a moment when I have felt more hopeful than now. It feels like some wheels are turning. Um, I feel hopeful because there's so many of us out there doing this type of work. Lizzie, what gives you hope? Younger generations, this panel, uh, the <laughs> fire in the bellies of Extinction Rebellion on the streets, the changing landscape of natural history filmmaking, this change in the environmental sector in terms of like how it's funded and how it's approached, like the change is here, it's happening. Um, and it needs to because we are past climate change, we are at climate crisis. And, you know, actually, strangely, it's that it's that fire in the bellies, which I think has has led to those movements which has led to hope you know before it kind of seemed like it was a very it has been something that you know lots of people have been talking about for a very long time and finally people are starting to wake up so I think this panel gives me hope and hearing from all of you amazing women and just younger people like it's it's happening all around the world so that <laughs> Dr Wolsey <laughs> well first of all ditto on all of that um I think one of the stories that gives me hope a lot, in fact, a professor from Australia just sent me a photograph of a reef that I used to work on a lot. And in 2008, it was completely wiped out by a cyclone. And in fact, mm -hmm. uh, me documenting the impacts was my first ever, um, first authored peer reviewed publication. So it has a lot of meaning to me. And he just sent me a picture um, that the reef has grown back and, you know, in, a little over 10 years, if it's free from disturbance, if it's in a marine protected area, it's offshore, um, and it, it luckily escaped bleaching events because of where it is in cooler upwelling. But nature can recover if we give it the space, right? Mm. Uh, coral reefs are not as fragile as we think they are. They're just under so many different pressures. And it's just so hopeful to see the resilience of an ecosystem being able to bounce back. And like Lizzie said, I think um, you know a panel like this reminds you that the future is female, the future is inclusive, the future is brilliant and blue. Like we we have so much on our side to solve these giant problems, and we have an amazing network to do it together. Well, that actually made me a little teary-eyed. <laughs> Inka, <laughs> what gives you hope? I think the issues that we see in our oceans, they're so human based and we can't separate our oceans from people. And what I'm really excited about is that we're starting to see such a new range of voices being brought to the table and discussing conservation. We're hearing from people who before weren't being given that platform. And I think the more that we're hearing those voices, the more hopeful I am that we're actually can come up with solutions that are going to make a real difference. So I think we're in a really good place for 
the environment right now. We just need to make sure we carry on listening, listening and learning from everybody. Not to mention the Biden administration announcing yesterday uh, yeah. that they're <laughs> embracing 30 by 30. <laughs> Malaika, tell, tell us about what gives you hope. You live in a country that has so many challenges. Well, that's a good question. I think um, I'm going to have a slightly different perspective on this. And the truth is that I don't always have hope, honestly. Sometimes I look at the issues around and I've been focusing on a lot of stories that I, I mean, I see a lot of dead animals every single day at work and I don't often have hope and there's no way to kind of sugarcoat that. But I think that what we need right now is to tell stories about the need for urgency. Everyone knows we have hope. We all know that there's optimism and like there's good stuff that can happen if we get together. But we need to realize that we have these short timelines and that if we exceed those timelines, we're going to be in big trouble. And I think for me as a filmmaker, what I really, really want to tell people is that we have this amazing world that we get to be stewards of, in a sense. And if we don't act right now in the next 10 years, in the next 20 years, or even shorter, I guess, we won't be able to save that. Um, so sometimes I don't have hope. But what does give me hope is the resilience of the natural world. I've seen mangroves coming back in places where they were completely raised down, coral reefs springing back up with the work of amazing scientists. And I think the communities on the front lines also are so excited about just being out there exploring the oceans and seeing what it's like to kind of dive with a manta or a shark for the first time, rather than always having that on their dinner plate, for example. So I think I do have hope. And honestly, just being here today with every single one of you gives me even more hope. So I think a little bit of my pessimism at the beginning of this question is going away. <laughs> <laughs> well, what you just did is exactly okay. the challenge of a storyteller. It's where you tell the truth, but you make it yeah. you know, digestible and actionable. Yeah. And that's that's our job. I mean, you did, a, did it beautifully just now. You've done a great that, job. That's, that's <laughs> our job. And uh, I think we're going to close with that. I want to say I'm really grateful for all of you. There was a time in my career when I felt really lonely and I felt the urgency and I didn't think people were paying attention. Seeing mm. all of you and knowing that you're out there warrioring it up makes me so hopeful and so grateful. I want to thank you all for what you do and for spending the afternoon with me. And I can't wait to go and spend some time in the wild with all of you wild ladies. Thank you. <laughs> thank, thank you. So thank you. <laughs> An expedition. And thank you so much. Yeah.